welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger and Rachel Wojtek, and we have been talking about the Greeks um, and ancient Greek religion. We talked about Homer and Hesiod last time. Hesiod? Hesiod? Mm-hmm. Hesiod. Hesiod. Tomato, tomato. Uh, <laughs> I've heard it both ways. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, we talked about how Homer kind of uh, made a coherent universe for all the gods to live in, um, and how he kind of destroyed the concept of Greek godhood in the process. <laughs> um, so what comes next in the immortal words of G- George the Third in Lin-Manuel Miranda's Hamilton? Wow, you snuck that <laughs> in there real good. <clears throat> Well, what happens is something that historians and philosophers have labeled the pre-Socratics. And it sounds really impressive. And historians tell us all kinds of amazing things about these people. They were the first naturalists, the first scientists, first philosophers, the first men to actually look at the world without any regard to God and just ask intelligent questions. That is, if you read a history book that was written about 50 years ago, or any time <laughs> from the Enlightenment through about 50 years ago, that's pretty much what you would find out. Uh, this is this is the dawning of secularism, of rationalism. This is dumping... And just because, you know, just to be a historical <laughs> nitpicker, uh, anytime somebody's labeled a pre-something, you know that this is a historian's opinion being projected back. Because they didn't know that Socrates was coming up next. Yeah. <laughs> they certainly didn't call themselves the pre-Socratics. <laughs> this is true. And that, that is one of those things that you, uh, I'm glad you're bringing it up, that you need to learn to look for. It's kind of like watching um, a, um, a video taken on someone's phone, apparently. And, and, and you watch and you see this great, cool thing played out in front of you. But if you're paying attention, you finally ask yourself, wait, who was holding the camera? <laughs> and how did they know to turn it on right then? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, that kind of changes everything, doesn't it? You're right. Pre-Socratics is something, a name given by, as far as I know, the men of the Enlightenment and those who followed. Uh, because Socrates, Plato, Aristotle are their great heroes. And um, these are the guys who supposedly clear the ground for them, dumped religion, organized religion, the gods, and made it possible for Socrates to do a more thorough wrecking ball job of everything. Because, of course, Socrates was basically a secularist too from their point of view. And that brings us to Plato who started speculating about the mind, the soul, and such things, and then Aristotle takes it to another level. Except that's, yeah, a really biased interpretation. We we look to find heroes. And we're all guilty of this at some point or another. Mm-hmm. We look to find heroes. We find someone we think is really cool for one reason or another. And we then read into them all of our assumptions and presuppositions. Yeah, and what we would have meant by using their words. And yeah. What they meant by what, using those words. Mm-hmm. And things well, that's, we also do that to our enemies yeah. when we find them in history. <laughs> oh, that, you yeah, know, we do that too. And, and we make assumptions about things they actually never spoke about at all. But we know what they would have said because we know what we would have said had we been there. <laughs> and obviously we share more or less the same presuppositions. The um, uh, Jesuit historian of philosophy, Frederick Copplestone, who wrote a multi-volume series. It's actually quite good. It's from a Roman Catholic point of view. He does a pretty nice job of summing things up. But when when he comes to talk about um, some of the pre-Socratics, he uses Nietzsche as his mouthpiece. Now, for a Roman Catholic to use the man who said God is dead as his way of explaining what went on 2,000 years earlier should stink a fish somehow. Uh, uh, is that what Nietzsche was talking about in that <laughs> Because I thought we could interpret it differently. <laughs> I thought mm. it was God is dead and we have killed him. And that's not a good thing that we've secularized society. Well, yes, he was. Uh, well, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> what is good anyhow? Haven't is we it? moved beyond good? And <laughs> yes. 
I think I have that book from Nietzsche. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, from from Nietzsche's point of view, it's not exactly a happy thing, especially for the sheep in this world. But for those who are ready to take the next step in human evolution and become the Uberinch, the, the overman, uh, we, we, we face this godless world with a spring in our step and a smile on our face because it's our world now. And if we screw it up, it's all on us. Hmm. I don't know. Is that good or bad? It's not really cheerful. <laughs> <laughs> Because I have three guesses, and they're all that we're not going to do well at this. <laughs> oh, anyway, he um, Nietzsche uh, analyzing one of the the pre Socratic Thales, who claimed that all is water, um, says this roughly. He says, uh, first of all, Nietzsche says that Thales is saying something about the origin of things, and he's doing so without figure or fable, and. It contains, if only in crystal state, the idea everything is one. So this is what Nietzsche sees here. And Copplestone, a Jesuit, a Roman Catholic, apparently thinks this is a good summary. Thales, this pre-Socratic pre philosopher, we actually know more about than we do many of them. First of all, is making a claim about origins. He's eliminating figures of speech and fables, that is to say, myths. And he is making a claim about all of reality, everything is one. Um, now, Nietzsche goes on so to say- So he's being more blunt than the people who came before him, is what you're saying? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Just, <laughs> Just checking. No. Okay. Just making sure I'm following. Yeah. Uh, according to Nietzsche, the mere discussion of origins leaves Thales still in the company of religious and superstitious people. Okay, I thought, Nietzsche, I thought you would like the fact he talked about origins because, <laughs> you know, we're, we're rationally examining where things came from, but apparently not, because that's something- um, that that religious and superstitious people do, but by rejecting myths, whether the what Nietzsche would consider the myth of Genesis one or the myths of Hesiod, where the gods sprang out of chaos, um, he that that takes him out of the purely religious and makes him a natural philosopher because he's thinking in natural terms. And finally, the claim all is one makes him the first Greek philosopher, because he's making claims about the total of reality, apart from any divine revelation without it involving any kind of personal God. And and what uh, a lot of people have said ever since is, see, that's, that's what sets these people apart. They got rid of God. Well, no, they got rid of the gods. That's not the same <laughs> thing. Right. And, and perhaps if Americans had been a little more acquainted with Hinduism and Buddhism in the 1800s, um, not that they didn't know them at all, but it wasn't you know something the common man knew much about, or even the common common college professor. They might have seen that there are other kinds of religions than polytheism, and that they weren't they didn't belong to some retrograde superstitious moron someplace that actually very advanced civilizations claim made claims about a god or God or the divinity that is the universe. And they were okay with it, and they were nonetheless very religious. Religion is not confined to either, on the one hand, um, the God of the Jews or Christians, which most people take to be the same, or the many polytheistic gods that we're more familiar with in the West, Thor or Ra or Zeus or whatever, that there actually are other options. Um, now, if people had taken Emerson and um, Thoreau seriously, um, not in terms of their general intent, but in terms of what they were actually saying, we we might have missed we, we we might have been a little more alert and the church might have been a little more alert. Uh, you know the um, the poem by Emerson called Brahma, mm -hmm. where he speaks. Emerson speaks as Brahma. Uh, we're not told that except that the title is Brahma, but he he goes on to say, "I am this and I am that. I'm hot. I am cold. I am good. I am evil. I'm up. I'm down." And um, his daughter came to him and said, people don't understand what in the world you're saying. The Brahma thing is confusing. His response was, oh, just tell them to say Jehovah. It's the same thing. No. <laughs> <laughs> but it tells you where Emerson was coming from. He, mm -hmm. he understood that there is this thing called pantheism, which is a valid religious option in insofar as all 
rebellious, sinful options are valid for the <laughs> for the sinner. Um, sinner should not be saying, "My God, my faults. God's better than your faults." God, it's really that's not an intelligent way of doing business. Uh, but we didn't we didn't get that, and the people who wrote history books, sure enough, didn't get that, and so. When they saw Greeks abandoning, or at least downplaying, and not caring a whole lot about their the gods of Homer and Hesiod, the gods of the Greek myths, the gods that have been uh, relegated to superheroes in the Marvel and DC universes, um, they thought, "All right, well, that's that's good. They're abandoning superstition. They're abandoning gods. They're abandoning their religion. And the alternative to abandoning their religion is, of course, embracing no religion, right? Because we know they didn't embrace Christianity." So that leaves them where we are, you know, rationalists, objective, naturalists, looking for our answer in nature. That must have been exactly what, what they were all about. And that's not exactly what they were all about. One of, one of the problems with assigning ideas, beliefs, assumptions, presuppositions to people is that sometimes those people actually wrote down what they thought. And you can sometimes go and read what they thought and find out, wait, I wasn't told this. This is not what the history books say. This is not what the philosophers say. Uh, one of my great ones of, well, back when I was writing a series, which is actually a couple of years ago now or more, um, you know, we've all heard about the unmoved mover and we connect it with Aristotle. Mm -hmm. He didn't believe in an unmoved mover. He believed in 50 or 60 unmoved movers. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Why has no one mentioned this? Because it doesn't fit the story. And so mm -hmm. those sections are kind of skipped over or thought to be interpolations or something. But they're in the text that are, they get printed and it's kind of like there. Um, you know, it's like Socrates saying in effect that he's demon possessed and everyone wants to blow that off as, oh, he was just joshing them. Or speaking in metaphor. Because yeah. I would have been. Yeah. That's, I mean, I wouldn't yeah. believe in that kind of possibility. And so obviously yeah. he's just putting them on. And it's like you were saying with Emerson and Thoreau, it's kind of one of the great disservices that we do to the um, those who come after us when we dismiss these things as, mm -hmm. well, they said this, but they didn't really mean it. It's a disservice oh, yeah. to the authors themselves, as well as to anyone who's listening to us to right. try and figure out what they meant. Um, it reminds me very much of the phenomenon that Whitaker Chambers describes hmm. of the conservatives of his day being the first to put him down as a conspiracy theorist <laughs> uh, because they wanted to appear so sophisticated that hmm. they didn't want to admit that there could be a communist conspiracy. Yeah. It's like, um, you're, you're not helping yourself here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There, there are categories of thought that are intellectually unacceptable inappropriate for the, the polished, uh, refined scholars in our society. So we're not going to go there. We're just, uh, but again, sometimes um, the scribes of the medieval world have done us a disservice of actually recording what these guys said. And like, <laughs> it's sometimes it's fragments. Sometimes it's a little more than that. Sometimes it's someone else quoting them and criticizing them. There's not a lot for most of them. But one thing that keeps coming up, and, we'll, and next time we'll maybe look at some of the quotes just so it's not us saying these things. We'll actually maybe make a list of some of them. Say, here's what these guys actually said. We don't know a lot, but they keep talking about God. They keep talking about divinity and not as something they're rejecting. Yes, they reject pretty clearly the Hom Homerian myths and such. But not to the point of absolutely denying that there's a Zeus or Athena or such, just that they've been horribly misrepresented. Um, now, to what degree that meant, yeah, don't even don't even go there. Or to what degree it meant, well, there's wisdom's a god, isn't she? And the sun's <laughs> a god, isn't it? Um, and, and 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 since the alignment, we rush you. No, of course not. That's nonsense. Well, don't assume that people back there did that. Uh, the, um, it's so it's so interesting because there's so much nowadays about um, multiculturalism and mm -hmm. learning about other cultures and things like that. And yet so often we still seem to remain completely ignorant of what they were really doing because we don't want to talk about the things that we don't think they should have had. Um, right. And I was thinking of our 
discussion the last few times of just how thoroughly religious the Greek uh, culture was, Mm -hmm. um, starting out with ancestor worship, which involved uh, worship of land and um, agriculture and those because they all fed into the system. Mm. But then as it broadened into a bigger people group, you get more of the forces of nature um, Mm -hmm. being deified along with all of that. And I think if we were more um, consistent with what that culture was doing, these men in their naturalism are, as they're called nowadays, we're really just going back to, okay, we know the elements are there. We see some sort of power in them, which we call divine. Let's see if we can find a better uh, explanation than these, what have become kind of silly stories right. of Homer. Um, they're going back to those elements because they see power and what they would call something divine in them, um, which is what their whole culture would have said. And so they're not outside of the the norm, but rather just getting rid of some of the, some of the fluff that has been built in with stories and such, it seems like. Um, Here's some quotes from Philip Wheelwright. He wrote or compiled a book called The Pre-Socratics, which guess what? Is a collection of what we have from the Pre-Socratics <laughs> with his own commentary. And and some of what he's pulled together is, is, from Aristotle or whoever happened to actually remember them and quote them and interact with them at some point. And you can imagine the problems there. Uh, it's, it's fine to, I suppose, read, oh, I don't know, Hodge or um, Warfield to get an idea of what Arminius said. <laughs> but probably at some point you sh- actually should read what Arminius wrote if you're going to accuse him of things. We know well enough what his followers say. We can listen to them on radio, so that's easy. <laughs> but if you want to go back and say, I was amazed to go back and read Finney, mm-hmm. read his own words. It's like, you got to be kidding. I knew that uh, the Reformers, or the Reformed Presbyterians didn't like him, but this guy was Looney Tunes. What is going on here? Why? Yeah. Because Often we don't... Yeah, the, you know. the criticism is... It has to be very tempered, otherwise it will be dismissed as mere outrage. Right. And so we often, you would get the impression that it was much, the original, the thing that's being criticized is much more reasonable (laughs) than it was. (laughs) And sometimes it is. Sometimes. And sometimes it's not. Uh, Jacob Arminius actually appreciated a lot about Calvin and Mm -hmm. uh, pointed to him as as a great preacher and commentary, or commentator. Arminianism Um, really got got, uh, the shaft with, uh, Unitarianism. I feel like pre-Unitarian Arminianism was a different animal. Yeah. Anyway, that's <laughs> yeah. Anyway, here's what Tangent. Philip Philip Wheelwright says in a, a bit here and there. He says uh, the um, the Ionian philosophers first tried systematically to explain nature in terms of nature, instead of referring to the referring to the supposed will or caprices of supernatural beings. So they made a distinction between nature and the beings that might be behind it and move it. Second, they gave preference systematically for perhaps the first time. Like we know the the writings <laughs> of the ancient world when nobody left anything for us. But we assume again that, that, you know, this is the first time. For perhaps the first time to the kinds of observations that can be shared by virtually any interested or unprejudiced observer. Um... I don't even know. I I know what he's saying. It's just so completely wrong. I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> uh, they, for the first time, the kinds of observations that can be shared by virtue of the arc is uh, one and a half cubits by one cubit. I mean, whoa. there's all kinds of data in scripture and in other classical sources that's plain matter of fact. Anybody can understand what's going on here. Now, the to understand the whole intent of the author in a passage is something else. But the information in part, this is not a new thing. The Greeks didn't suddenly wake up and say, I will now speak with nouns and verbs. Uh, so, I don't know. Third, the Milesians began to make a practice of seeing the individual thing or event, not that it's an isolated phenomena of interest in itself alone, but as a representative and systematic of a class. I, again, don't know why he makes that claim. Maybe I should go back and read more of what he said. Uh, but uh, the leaning here is towards science. 
we don't care about this apple that falls and hits Newton's head. We care about apples in general and why they fall and hit anybody on the head. That is generalizing to the natural law. Okay, if that's what he's after, some of the Greeks kind of tried to maybe do that. But to say that no one had done it before from the non-evidence that we have, the argument from silence is called a fallacy mm -hmm. in anybody's book. Uh, but even if they were the first, that's no, they weren't the first. I don't. Again, it's the the, the claims here are um, curious, as Alice would say. And then <laughs> yeah, the the concept of education uh, mm -hmm. relies on cause and effect and mm. the consistency of the world of God's faithfulness to govern the world in a consistent way. Well, not only And we know education. that education has been around since <laughs> children have been around. Yeah, well, so. stepping behind education, language. Mm -hmm. I can say, uh, Billy, bring me the cat, and Billy understands cat and bring and me. There's no problem here, and he is able to distinguish this cat from all cats, but he knows what a cat is, and if I say, oh, there's a strange cat in the backyard, chase him away, he doesn't say, I do not know strange cats, I only know this cat. He knows what he can generalize beyond the specific. But sir, I don't think we're communicating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Give me some tea. <laughs> I think we are communicating. Yes. Okay. For those of you who didn't get it, that's a reference to something in Francis Schaeffer. You can find it. Um, I'm sure my, we'll come back to that. Story I'm sure. Point. <laughs> Michael Grant has been the modern authority on classical society. He's not a great writer, but he's pretty clear, and he know, he he knows a lot. He's very learned, very well read. He I I, I must have five or six of his books, uh, and I found him of great use in just laying out the facts of the development of Greek and, and, and Roman culture. He says this about the Ionian or Milesian philosophers. He says the Milesians insisted on the application of rationally comprehensible unbreachably regular human criteria to the universal facts of physical existence. And such an endeavor made possible the spread of the literacy, uh, possible, let me try that again. And such an endeavor made possible by the spread of the literacy has been described perhaps without exaggeration as the Greeks' greatest single claim to fame. And again, Professor Grant, I think you're making some really huge assumptions here. Uh, is there anything that you've just attributed to the Greeks that Israel wasn't doing centuries before and recording in Scripture? But of course, Scripture doesn't count because it's a religious book, and what the Milesians were doing wasn't, right? <laughs> That's kind of the whole point. Um, the funny thing is, Grant himself comes back and says this with regard to Thales, the guy who said all his water. True, despite the claims that Thales and Anaximander and Anaximenes were the founders of these sciences, the time for their inauguration had not yet quite arrived, for they were in many ways curious rather than scientific, and despite personal <laughs> observations, were obliged to base their dogmatic and sometimes naive conclusions on insufficient evidence. Okay, there's a very strong tendency in this, just that little bit that you read, to see history as moving inevitably towards this thing we call science. Right. And they were on their way, but they weren't quite there. And notice, this is Grant, who has just praised them to the sky, saying, well, th but there were some problems. Um, first of all, they weren't really scientific, and they're thinking, uh, what? <laughs> They were just curious. In other words, they ask a lot of questions, kind of like a six-year-old. Uh, and despite personal observations, we're obliged to base their dogmatic. That's a, you know, that's a bad word when you talk to Christians. Christians are dogmatic. That's not a compliment. <laughs> it's saying we're we're stubborn and we have we're opinionated and we hold on to things without proof. He's using that of these guys. That's fundamentally and, a religious word too. Yeah, referring it is. to essential doctrine. Right. And sometimes naive conclusions. Mm -hmm. They they were kind of stupid in what they came up with. Yes. <laughs> oh, on insufficient evidence, because they didn't use this, anything approaching a scientific method to compile evidence. They looked at a couple of things and thought, huh, I wonder. Yeah, I bet that's it. Here, everybody, I got a great idea. Listen to this. 
That's not science by anybody's by any stretch of the imagination or by anyone's definition. Um, they extrapolated from insufficient evidence. Yeah, Father Copplestone goes on and says something similar. As far as strict scientific proof goes, they had not sufficient data to warrant their assertion of unity. They hadn't gone all about the universe. They hadn't left home, still less <laughs> to warrant the assertion of any particular ultimate principle, whether water, fire, or air. The fact is that the early cosmologists, that's what they're called since they talked about the nature of the cosmos, let beyond the data to the intuition of universal unity. No, it's intuition. They possess what we might call the power of metaphysical intuition, and this constitutes their glory and their claim to a place in the history of philosophy. In other words, they guess wildly without evidence, and um, yeah, that makes them a, great scientists. In a way that every other human being is also <laughs> capable of doing. <laughs> yeah, and they were wrong, so that makes them wait. But they were the first to be wrong. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> about big things, <laughs> like the cosmos. Uh <laughs> It's also assuming that all humans have an innate ability to um, guess the truth, mm -hmm. in a sense. That there's an intuition in all of us that can reach out and find what's really there. We don't, we're not all blind and um, well, apparently, see the world falsely without the true God. Apparently, these men were the next step in evolution because they were able to have those sorts of intuitions. Mm -hmm. Now, William Wordsworth or uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson would have understood such intuitions. They wrote about them a good deal, actually. <laughs> uh, As did Nietzsche. I mean, like, you know, Emerson and Thoreau are just German idealism warmed over, right? <laughs> Well, anyway, uh, as I said, we'll, we'll we'll look at what some of some more of what the uh, early cosmologists uh, said, but um, kind of moving toward uh, a summation. Not that we'll get there right away. I, one of you already basically said this. They're they're going back to nature and they're looking at the forces of nature. And they, as they began to say, all is fire, or all is water, or all is air, or all is the great emptiness or unknown, or whatever you want to call it, they were appealing to basic entities, principles, dimensions of the natural world. Uh, so in a sense, not too far removed, as you said earlier, from the first man who looked up at the sun and said, ooh, bright, warm, God. Uh, they they were looking for something that that would leave out the mythology, that would leave out the, the silly stories. And not a, a few um, secular writers at the tail end of the, uh, well, I guess the beginning of the 20th, early 20th century, began to look at this and say, huh, that's odd. Where would they look? Where would they get these ideas? Because the idea, uh, strangely enough, after honoring these Greeks as being so original, and again, these are the secular historians and philosophers who, who are making these claims. They don't consider the possibility that they actually did just invent them out of the, their own heads. <laughs> they assume they got the idea someplace. Well, that's a reasonable assumption, knowing the way that man's mind works. But it's interesting that your great creative Greeks who created a new heaven and a new earth, you are now abandoning because, probably because Christianity is no longer a threat in your mind. You no longer have to do battle with people who believe in an absolute God who is distinct from his creation and in terms of whom all things must be understood. So with that out of the way, we, we get it, with, with God dead, that God sufficiently removed from our thinking processes and from the, uh, the court of judgment. We can afford to be a little critical of the Greeks now, and we can begin to think, well, maybe they weren't all that. They, <laughs> they, they were curious, but not scientific. They had some data, well, but not much. It's always safe for the secularist to look at somebody in the past and say, they had the right idea, but they didn't take it far enough. Right. Um, because it's fundamentally not the, that they were wrong. Oh, does not Darwin come to mind right there? <laughs> anybody actually believe what Darwin wrote? Does anybody actually read what Darwin wrote? Uh, does anyone keep the subtitle of the book intact <laughs> on the preservation of favored races? Um, 
the, once the idea was in place, uh, how it was framed to where it went, uh, they were will, like today, people are willing to say, well, Darwin missed a lot. Yeah, like everything. <laughs> Not simply because he was wrong, but because he was wrong. He was wrong in his methods. He was wrong in his logic. He was wrong in his reasoning. He was wrong in the face of evidence that was there. Jim Mendel had begun his studies in genetics, but he didn't bother to look at anything like that. He just charged on, and everyone applauded where he ended up. And when it became clear that he had been wrong in a lot of areas, like, well, but, you know, he meant well and he got to the right place, so let's now backfill and and, and try to... Uh, try to lay the proper foundations that he would have used had he known about them, if he had our brilliance and our science. And the same thing here with the history of philosophy. Uh, and so the, uh, the more modern writers are beginning to look around, and they're looking to the East, because it's about this time that the Greeks came in contact with the Persians. You remember that Alexander the Great will conquer the Persian Empire and Alexander's teacher was Aristotle. Aristotle's mm -hmm. teacher was Plato. Plato's teacher was Socrates, and just behind him lie these so called pre Socratics, which is to say, some of these guys were active and working about the same time that Daniel was standing before Cyrus, that Mordecai was prime minister of the Persian Empire, that Esther was queen. And so First of all, we have the Persian religion with its worship of fire and air and all of that, but we also have the possibility of Christian influence, which may account for some of their grasp of monotheism. Uh, there is uh, one of the last of the pre-Socratics, actually, when, and we'll save him for next time, actually goes so far as to say there's only one God. And and makes other claims about him that at first blush sound like a little like biblical theism. If, if, if he would just stop and not say anymore, <laughs> you could easily believe, oh, this this was a this was a man who this is one of Lewis's noble pagans who by his own <laughs> reason got to to monotheism of a Christian flavor. When you start reading all that he said, like, oh no, that's not really what he's saying at all. But you know, even the idea that God is one mission that, um, you sh yeah, well, it, and, and, and here I think we, we need to make, a, we need to introduce a new front to the battle. We've been talking about men of the Enlightenment and rationalists and all of that, and the, those who fancy themselves son of, sons of Greece. We need to introduce Christians now, because a great many Christians, beginning with the Church Fathers, looked back to some of these people and said, ah, God reveals himself in many ways. He speaks in nature. Has not Paul told us that the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen in the things he's made? So these men were grasping after the true God, and some of them came very close, and some of them, depending on which church father you're reading, some of them may be the equivalent of Old Testament saints just in their respective cultures. And uh, we may meet Plato in heaven. Do you know who Plato really was? And if you actually read what he wrote, we're back to that again. Uh, I actually had a pastor ask me whether or not all the criticism of Plato was perhaps overdone because maybe he was getting too close to Christian theism and maybe what he actually was arguing for was the God of the Bible. Like, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, you, I don't remember what I told him, but what I should have said is, you need to go back and read Plato. Let me find the excerpts for you to, to read. Uh, and so, so <laughs> people who are listening to a podcast on history, here's a lesson. Read the sources <laughs> insofar as you can, at least in translation. Mm -hmm. Read the sources. Read what the original people actually said in context, who they were talking to, what their own critics said at the time, and and how people understood them. We, for instance, we look at Socrates and we see him as a martyr for teaching God's not talk to the state and corrupting the youth. The problem is he was guilty on both charges. <laughs> um, he thought he should get a pension for it. Yeah, he, he thought he should get a pension for for violating the laws of the state. Yeah, and and people have made a a big fuss over him and declared him a hero. But please remember 
that the citizens of Athens, this metropolis of rationalism you're so proud of, are the people who condemned him to death. <laughs> so you can pick one random Greek philosopher who said that he had a demon in his head, or you can pick, you can side with Athens itself. Either way, you're probably not going to be happy with what you get because there <laughs> is a fundamental conflict here. Choose this day whom you will serve. Yeah. <laughs> you got many and, wrong options to choose from. Yeah. And when Joshua said that, that's exactly what he was doing. He has said, you should be serving Jehovah, but if you will not serve him, then choose who you will serve, whether the gods of Egypt or the gods beyond the flood or the gods of this land, but it's for me and my house people serve the Lord. It was not exactly an altar call. <laughs> it was, you, you go find a God someplace, at least be consistent in your apostasy. That'd be nice so we know what you're talking about. Um, yeah. But as you were saying, um, you know, we've talked in the past about how these are kind of dangerous ideas mm. and we still encourage you to go back and read them. Um, it's, it's like the yes. kitchen knife. And <laughs> if you don't know how to work through them, get some knife skills, <laughs> um, uh, work your way up to it, um, get some guidance. Um, if we can be a small part of that, great. But also people in your life who are well-educated and familiar mm -hmm. with both the Bible and these dangerous ideas, um, the solution yeah. is not to run away from them and never encounter them or hide from them. Yes, for a number of reasons. And I, I really appreciate that, Emily. As a Christian school teacher, this is something we I know we come up against a great deal. Why are you reading that book to our children? Why is that book on your reading list? Don't you know what's in that book? Yeah, actually, uh, I was asked once why we had um, Hawk, Stephen Hawkins' book, uh, History of Time, mm. on the reading list. And I suspect all of the objection came from a student who did it very politely. While his mother was near at hand, I think she was kind of, <laughs> you know, go ask. Uh, I could see behind it the hand of their pastor, who has been very critical of us having the children read evil books. And before anyone jumps to conclusions, the man considers himself a Puritan and a Presbyterian. Um, and I say, look, you're going to encounter these ideas in college. Wouldn't it be better to face them now where you can come to your Christian teachers and say, what is this guy talking about? Or why is this wrong? It sounds good. Rather than get it in a physics class uh, when you go to college a thousand miles from home. There are things you do need to face because they're out there. And unfortunately, sometimes they're in the church. And so we, I appreciate the get some nice skills. You don't want to throw... Uh, an eleven-year-old right into Marx any more than you want to throw him right into Plato, but you need to help him learn how to think. And some examples from the original sources here or there are not amiss as you do that, uh, whether they be uh, pagan philosophers or whether they be Christian heretics. You sometimes need to show them. Yet there are real people out there that think these things. That, yeah, I understand why why you're laughing and it's funny. But it's not funny that these people actually do believe them and lead their leave their lives in terms of them and lead other people into these ideas. So you have to be prepared, son, you, daughter. You have to know what's going on here. You have to be able to think. You have to be able to think th through these things. There are Many some things in the kitchen that you can't do with a butter knife. Sorry, yeah. I'm going to like <laughs> nail this, this analogy as far as it will go. <laughs> um, but yeah. to be... To be bearing witness to Christ in the world, you need to be able to communicate with people and answer them. Be ready to give an answer. And that means hearing what they have to say. Uh, it, yeah. And I think it also means we have to address the ongoing issue that we have that we keep assuming there there's neutrality in there that we mm -hmm. can stand on and that we can, people can basically almost get themselves to God. Um that they can pretty much find the truth on their own through uh, general revelation through the creation. Um, and so there's, there's this over uh, confidence in human reason and ability to, to get either for people to get themselves there or for us to argue people there in, mm -hmm. in evidence um, that is missing the underlying assumption of without 
a true knowledge of the God of the Bible, you cannot understand anything properly. And so when you go to those, those sources and part of learning to have the knife skills, if you will, is learning to see, okay, here's where they're, they're imaging God and they're corrupting it. Um, Mm -hmm. Rather than going, wow, look how close they're getting to God. It's no, this is them barely touching God and then messing it all up. Um, And recognizing the tragedy of that, I think is really mm -hmm. important. Yeah. Rather than glorifying their, um, near Christian paganism <laughs> that even works or belittling uh, them. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, Schaefer would say, we need to weep for these people mm-hmm. for their sensitivity mm-hmm. and their intelligence. But that doesn't mean we should misread what's really going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, in lines with what you were saying, speaking of some knife skills, uh, I meant to talk about this and then completely lost my place. Here are, here are some presuppositions that people often bring to the table in discussing God, particularly in a history book or history course. Mm-hmm. Philosophers are a little more careful and have finer tools to work with, better knives, if you will. Uh, but when you approach a history book, th- this is the kind of stuff you get. One, all gods are pretty much the same. It's just a question of which, well, which God do you worship? Which gods? Oh, you worship gods. Okay, so you worship these gods. They worship those gods. People over here worship me. Oh, it's uh, Odin and Thor here. It's Ra and Isis. Uh, over here, it's it's Zeus. Oh, and the duplicate version over there in Rome with Jupiter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as opposed to, well, the, the Mohammedans, the uh, Muslims, they worship a single god, as do the Unitarians and the Deists. And so they then, must be all fundamentally the same. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just they're they're all gods, right? What is polytheism, pantheism, theism, and what by saying I'm an atheist, I'm simply saying I don't go for any of those choices. Therefore, I am not religious. Well, you just made a huge religious claim that you know for a fact that God doesn't exist. You just claimed omniscience. Hmm, that's kind of hard and odd. Well, and it's funny because I think sometimes people create almost like a, a spectrum of um, like the level that a religion is close to Christianity. And so like mm. Islam is better because it's got more of Christianity <laughs> right, right. than say, you know, Hinduism. And so we put them, we lay them out, but we still compare all of them to Christianity as though they're on the same right. uh, spectrum yeah. or level. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All gods are pretty much... The same. The second thing, all gods are supernatural, except those that aren't. <laughs> isn't God by nature? Um, it, you know, isn't by nature? Okay, I'm using the word nature in two ways. So I'm confusing <laughs> myself. Isn't God by nature, not nature? Isn't that what we mean by God? He's not somebody who's part of nature. And there was a time when the West would say, well, yes. We don't believe that anymore. God is immersed in nature, imminent in nature. Nature is God. And you don't have to go to um, India to find this. You can go to Berkeley um, or to your local bookstore and look under the, if it's still called New Age, I don't know what they call it these days. Uh, <laughs> but even those people who go out into nature as Christians to be with God because they're closer to God there than they are in church yes. are also finding a greater degree of God in nature than in the places he said he'll be. I'm going to throw an old favorite hymn under the bus. Uh, I come to the garden alone. Oh, oh, all the ah! still on the <laughs> yeah. It's a bad oh, hymn. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I make no apology about saying that it's a bad hymn. I'm not sure. It's I'm a, a little hymn. bit sorry. I feel like somebody out there is going to be like, oh, but that's my favorite. I'm sorry. It's a bad <sighs> hymn. I'm sorry it's, you like a bad hymn. There are so many better ones. <sighs> And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. That's individualism mm-hmm. and mysticism. To and, the mm-hmm. extreme. No yeah. one can even duplicate my mystical experience. My mystical experience is better than anyone ever's. Yeah, and it has nothing to do with the Bible, even though no, I've it said doesn't. that it, it's Jesus who meets me. Having no I, foundation I feel it. I don't put it into words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So... We, we, we talk blithely of gods and we seem to be putting them above nature. And then, but little by little, we realize that not all gods are. In fact, most of them aren't really. 
uh, even the the uh, polytheistic deities of the West were expressions of natural forces, anthropomorphized, perhaps personalized to an even greater extent. And yet that's their origin in many cases where they weren't actually human beings that people could remember and worshipped. Um, the, the sun god was the sun. Um, and you, you tick through all of the powers that are represented in Olympus or Asgard, and these were initially natural powers that people wanted to put a face on. Um, the, um, the third thing here, the heart of science is naturalism. Anyone remember the Berenstain Bears? I yes. loved them as a kid. Mm. <laughs> they have one called uh, The Bear's Nature Guide, A Nature Walk Through Bear Country. Sounds copyright. very innocent and innocuous. I'm copyright sure it's a wholesome 1975. book. Yeah, oh, uh, it's perfectly wholesome if by that you mean you're not a, encouraged to rape or murder your neighbor. But That, we, that would be a start of what I mean by wholesome, <laughs> I suppose. <Yeah. laughs> But here's what they, the bears tell us. Nature is all that is and was and ever will be. Hmm. Which There's is a quote more or less claims. from Carl Sagan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, nature is all that is and was and ever will be. If gods there be, those gods are encompassed within nature because there's nothing outside of nature. That doesn't mean, however, that there can't be gods within nature. Nature itself can be a plethora of gods, as long as they're all natural gods. As long as they play nice together. Yeah, and, and you can begin to bring this to the things that Lewis discussed in that hideous strength in the abolition of man. Mm -hmm. What happens when the apostates virtually worship the forces of nature, not suspecting for a moment that the thing moving the needle is a demon? What do you do then? What happens when sorcery and science meet? Because they both give you power. Mm -hmm. you got some problems. And you can say all you want, but there's no religion here. See, Lewis argues that's when the devil wins. The materialist magician, when we no longer acknowledge God, but we accept supernatural forces or hypernatural forces. Get, let's get the word super out of there so it doesn't sound like anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, But that's okay. We can do that. We just can't have a God who stands outside of nature as its author, its controller, and its judge. Well, a supernatural God who can intervene in the universe is unacceptable. But gods existing within the system are fine. So what's the problem then scientifically with naturalism? Well, as Lewis foresaw, so sci the science of parapsychology suggests we can have spirits and have science. We just can't have the God of the Bible, they think, and have science. Christians would put it the other way. <laughs> Without a God who maintains order and structure in the universe and gives it meaning, you can't have science. And having demons crashing about the universe is antithetical to a scientific outlook on the universe. Animists did not create the scientific revolution. Mm -hmm. That came out of the Reformation. Yeah. Um, and then one other thing to borrow a line from Josephine Tay. 40 million history books couldn't possibly be wrong. Oh, dear. But, yeah, <laughs> but all the history sources say that, yeah, throw the history books. No, don't really. Keep the history <laughs> books. They're good for a laugh sometimes, and sometimes for tracking down <laughs> obscure information. Uh, I uh, I used to have, I, I think I replaced it, but I had a cyclop. Uh, a set of Encyclopedia Britannica that went back to the beginning of the 20th century, I believe. It was really cool because, uh, J Rachel, you would have loved it for teaching church history because all the mm -hmm. church fathers had their own entries. Mm. Oh, wow. They uh, Detailed, lengthy entries. Which is mm -hmm. fascinating from a historical perspective to say people valued that information back they, then. Yeah, yeah. The dawn of the 20th century, people still thought those were things worth knowing. Try to find that now even on the internet and you get you know, well, you know, you've taught the class little sketchy boxes of criticism of uh, saints. Well, anyway, the next thing I suppose to do, we suppose we should do, and that would be next time, is to um, 
look through some of these men with a little more detail, ending with uh, the the two that uh, Vantil always comes back to, Heraclitus and Parmenides, because they're just fun, mm -hmm. and extreme examples of of deifying unity or diversity. But in the meantime, I think we're out of time. We are. And we've been extra sarcastic and salty this week, so <laughs> we should be <laughs> extra positive and charitable with our recommendations. Mm, is that how that works? <laughs> I, I think so. Okay. Well, uh, little Mary Sunshine, what uh, <laughs> what what do you have to recommend? Um, I'm I'm going to make an ironic recommendation <laughs> um, in light of everything that we've just talked about. But the Disney movie Hercules, which I watched for the first time last night, hmm. um, I think it was a delightful movie. So, um, I watched it with some friends, and one of them asked me afterwards, so what was your analysis? And I was like, I had a fun time. <laughs> um, I think you are giving me too much credit for an analytical mind. Um, but honestly, it's it's a delightful movie. Tons of Christological imagery, ironically. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> just delightful. There's, there's an excellent commentary on it that I did listen to some months ago. Um, so I did have some context going in, and that's the the popcorn parenting podcast episode about Hercules, which I mm. think is now on YouTube under the name of the Reformed Mythologist. Mm. Um, that's Nate Morgan Locke's channel. Um, he did the popcorn parenting podcast with James Carey, but they no longer do it. But I think it's still available under the Reformed Mythologist uh, okay. title. So, and I agree, it was a fun. I saw the movie when it first came out, and was half-hearted about it. I saw it again not long ago and really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Because I think like you, I was like, I, I I know all the criticisms. Let's just see if this thing can entertain me. And of course, who's the actor who plays Hades? I don't know. He's hilarious. He's hilarious. Is he, I know it's I, not Billy Crystal, is no, it? No, 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 no. I'm Googling it as we speak. <laughs> Logan Cunningham? No. no. He's somebody Sorry, that's very a different well Hades. James Woods? James Woods, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he does a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. um, he's worth the, the, the price of the movie. Hercules, yeah, okay. But <laughs> Hades, yeah. Hades is one of the best villains. <laughs> yes, he is. So good. All right, Rachel, you got anything? Because I don't. <laughs> yes, mine is is uh, on a very different train. Uh, but I thought of the fact my um, my husband David just handed me back a book that he used this last year to help him teach a Sunday school class going through the history of Christian worship. Mm. And it is called Worshiping with Calvin um, mm. by Terry Johnson. And I'm recommending it because a lot of what he does is go back to the sources and the early church and the Reformation church to see how they really worshiped compared mm -hmm. to how we're worshiping and the different, the difference of our overall um, approach in presuppositions and things like that. And what we're looking for in worship as it contrasts between the old and modern. Um, and it's always a good look to realize what we do nowadays in many churches is so uh, historically unusual. Um, <laughs> sort of like the 20th century. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. 20th century in general. Um, but I think it's, it is very helpful to see some, more of the sources and what the men of different times of church history had to say about how to worship and why they worship that way. Excellent. Very cool. <sighs> well, I'm sure I've recommended her before, but I'm going to recommend her again. Josephine Tay. Beginning with The Daughter of Time, but working through all of her other detective novels. They're not quite the Agatha, Agatha Christie, let's put everyone in a English country manner and have them die one by one, and then have the detective come along and with brilliant logic figure out what's going on. This is more of um, a visit with a friend as he's facing some sort of crime that maybe is important, maybe not that big a deal. Um, but starting with Daughter of Time, our hero detective is in a hospital bed and can't get out. And so he ends up researching historical mystery, the murder of the two princes in London Tower, and finds out the textbooks are not all they're cracked up to be. And that's where the quote, 40 million textbooks couldn't possibly be wrong, could they? Uh, it's a good introduction to medieval history, to the Wars of the Roses, 
um, and to thinking about thinking about history. So mm. Josephine Tay in general, and particularly the daughter of time. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for this conversation. It's been a delight. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. And a big thank you to our financial supporters for keeping the show rolling. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with us, dear listener, you can send us an email at haltingtowardsion at gmail.com. Please do so. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and if you'd like to join the ranks of our financial supporters, the best way to do that is through our Patreon. You can find that at patreon.com slash haltingtowardsion. Um, share us with a friend uh, share us on social media if you exist in that realm um, also share us with a friend in person and see what happens you know it's kind of like throwing a throwing a conversational grenade into a room sometimes making a recommendation <laughs> like that but uh, here we are we're sarcastic and we're salty and uh, we hope you've enjoyed this episode <laughs> <laughs> have a wonderful week we'll see you next time